All right, everybody, we've got a very special guest, the esteemed, brilliant CEO of the company Mindbloom that we've spoken about. Uh, uh, I will let you describe what Mindbloom is, Dylan. I would call it a ketamine, telemedicine, uh, personal development, mental health company. But you can correct me on where that's wrong. I think you nailed it. I First and foremost, super pumped to jam with you both, and especially pumped that you're rocking the Mindbloom swag. Oh, yeah, I don't know if people can see. <laughs> I was a customer of Mindbloom at one point. So Dylan, Dylan's a, for people that, that uh, know me, Dylan's a very good friend of mine from college. So I got in on the ground floor. I was an alpha tester of the Mind Bloom product. And I've talked about it on the podcast a couple of times before. And uh, now we have you on. Tell us all about psychedelics and the future of psychedelics and just jam on life. Yeah, uh, I think you nailed it. I mean, we're a mental health and well-being brand helping people achieve life-changing personal and professional breakthroughs with at-home psychedelic therapy. Uh, and the psychedelic that we're using is ketamine therapy, which is uh, the only prescribable psychedelic medicine available in the U.S. today. Uh, but hopefully that's going to change uh, quite soon with a bunch of these clinical trials for MDMA and psilocybin and a bunch of other really promising psychedelics and neurotechnologies. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, my first question <laughs> is prompted by our producer, Justin, who's adamant that the people want to know uh, what is a ketamine experience like? So I think a lot of people have never done ketamine. When they think of it, they think of it as a party drug or a horse tranquilizer. And so it's confusing when you mention it as a uh, psychedelic that can help improve someone's life. I think people often get caught off guard by that. So what is a ketamine psychedelic experience like? Hmm. Yeah, this is the, the classic described indescribable experience question. Yep. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to do it anyways. Uh, so... One, when you talk about whether or not it's a psychedelic, uh, the the word psychedelic is derived uh, from a couple, I think, Greek words in terms of etymology, and it really means like mind manifesting. So any you know molecular substance that has uh, these sort of cognitive expanding qualities are generally classified as psychedelics. Uh, so that includes the classical psychedelics like psilocybin or, or LSD, uh, and also you know some of the phenethylamines like MDMA, uh, and also some of the dissociative psychedelics like um, like ketamine or, or maybe even nitrous oxide. Uh, the way that I think about the ketamine experience, and there's a lot of different ways to describe it, is that it uh, falls into three buckets. There's the uh, emotional experience the cognitive experience, and then the neuroplastic experience that can persist both during the experience and like three to 14 days afterwards, according to neuroimaging studies. Uh, so the emotional experience for a lot of people can feel very empathogenic, uh, similar to MDMA, or, or some people think of it as like MDMA All or right. ecstasy. I'm, I want to cut in for a potential, <laughs> for a potential uh, help this be more helpful. Talk to someone who doesn't know anything about psychedelics or medicine. So like more entheogenic might not mean anything to that person. Uh, yeah, so when I say more empathogenic, what I mean is that it helps people feel like they're connected to other people. It can feel like they can feel deep feelings of gratitude, uh, deep feelings of connection with other people, both like loved ones and strangers, mm -hmm. uh, deep feelings of um, of sort of joy. And so for a lot of Mind Blooms clients who have uh, these ruminative mood and thought disorders like anxiety and depression, uh, and some of them have comorbidities with like OCD and PTSD and, uh, and, and some other things, uh, they feel emotionally uplifted sometimes for the first time in like 5, 10, 15, or 20 years. Um, so the sort of uh, uh, heart opening effects, if you're, if you're getting sort of like what it actually feels like, mm -hmm. uh, can be similar to MDMA, usually not as intense. Um, the second bucket are the cognitive or sort of mental effects. Uh, so for a lot of people, um, they will experience uh, these insights and perspectives. Uh, sometimes it's tied to what they're trying to work on coming in. So we have everybody at Mindbloom set intentions and write them out about what they're looking to change or explore or uncover, which can prime their subconscious. Uh, but oftentimes the things that come up are completely different. And so for for a lot of people going through a ketamine experience, uh, they can feel both creative, but have these uh, deep insights into ways that they want to make changes in their life or, um, or you know, discoveries that they make about themselves. Uh, the third bucket is the neuroplastic 
state and experience. Uh, so ketamine is a, uh, a neuroplastic agent. Uh, neuroplasticity essentially means that the brain is getting into this state where it's more readily able to change and to make healthier uh, sort of connections between synapses, which are the connections between brain cells or neurons. Uh, so for a lot of people coming out of these experiences, their brain is like literally primed for them to create healthier behaviors and patterns, both in terms of how they act and also in terms of how they feel. Um, so one of the uh, uh, sort of hallmark analogies that I think Michael Pollan writes about in his book, How to Change Your Mind as well, is the idea that over time, uh, as you go through life, you like develop these grooves in your brain mm -hmm. that are kind of like uh, ski tracks in the snow. And they get worn deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and when you uh, take a neuroplastic agent, whether that's ketamine or it could be psilocybin or LSD, uh, these have all been shown to create this neuroplastic effect uh, through the secretion of what's called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It's like HGH for the brain or fertilizer for the brain. Uh, it essentially layers in like another layer of snow, covers up those tracks so you can get out of those ruts and grooves and create new ones. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. no, go ahead. Yeah, and neuroimaging studies show that there could be this period of like three to 14 days after any given ketamine therapy experience uh, where somebody is primed in this neuroplastic state. And so I think that's one of the big opportunities for the application of ketamine or other psychedelic medicines. It's not just to help you feel better right now and to give you, you know, that activation energy and motivation and insight, uh, but actually priming your brain to go out there and make those changes and have them stick. Because we know that getting people to change their behavior is hard. Yep. Uh, it's hard to change my behavior. It's near impossible to get somebody else to change their behavior. Uh, and if we can help people actually, you know, create healthier habits and behaviors, then that's going to show up as, you know, getting out of depression and anxiety and becoming a better person for themselves and for others. Yeah. And what's the, what is the actual experience like? So for instance, I'll say when I do psilocybin, it is, the best way I can describe it is it's kind of like a Beatles music video. And maybe if I close my eyes and I go internally with binaural beats and a sleep mask, it's different. But if I just take psilocybin and then interact with the world, crazy colors, a tree becomes an elephant made of leaves that stomps along. And then as I follow it, a dragon flies in, right? It's very much like yellow submarine and ketamine. That wasn't my experience, but you obviously have done it a lot more and you've yeah, probably had hundreds of people that, that you can pull from in terms of their own experience. What is the average experience like on ketamine? Is it an intense visual psychedelic experience in the way that people think of acid or mushrooms? Or is it something that's a bit calmer? Like what is someone, what can they expect if they come in? They're like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Yeah. It's hard to describe the sort of uh, the hallucinogenic properties. So like the visual distortion mm -hmm. and oral distortion. Um, that's really getting into describing an ineffable experience or an indescribable experience. Uh, but here's, here's one way I think about it. Uh, whereas some of the classical and serotonogenic or uh, molecules that act on your serotonin system primarily, uh, like psilocybin and LSD, um, they really enhance your senses to the point of distortion. Mm -hmm. Those are your visual senses, your auditory senses, your t like taste senses, and definitely your, your mental senses. Um, it's very in the foreground, and like you just pointed out, everything gets uh, very distorted. Uh, then you have some other psychedelic therapies and medicines like ayahuasca, which is derived from DMT and this MAOI, um, and I believe you both have spoken about your respective ayahuasca mm -hmm. experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and that acts a little bit more on the background. So on ayahuasca, people tend to have visions and memories. Uh, they still have like visual um, distortions, but I mean, in maybe your ayahuasca experience, you've talked about how a lot of it is done with your eyes closed, kind of going inward and seeing what comes up. Uh, ketamine is pretty unique in that it doesn't act on your serotonin system, like some of these other uh, psychedelic medicines. Uh, it acts on your glutamate system, which is the most common neurotransmitter in your brain and is responsible for, we think it's responsible for encoding uh, memory and learning. Uh, and it actually acts as an antagonist, not an agonist. So rather than sort of potentiating the system, it actually cuts the system off, which is why a lot of people talk about how their ketamine experiences can feel very out of body. It almost feels like your brain is disconnected from your body and you can mm. sort of flow outside of it. Uh, be maybe because of that, um, the experience is really in the background. Uh, so it's not enhancing your senses as much, although it can 
enhance your senses and it can also make things a little blurry. It's, uh, it is an anesthetic, even if you're taking it at like a, you know, a, a one twentieth to one fifth of an anesthetic dose when you do it as a psychedelic. Um, but with your eyes closed and going inward, for a lot of people, it brings up Uh, it can bring up like shapes and colors and visions, uh, but also a lot like really from the background in terms of memory. Uh, a lot of people describe sort of walking through a hall of doors and being able to uh, at will go in and out of different memories, uh, including memories that they completely forgot that they had, maybe mm -hmm. hadn't even thought that they encoded into like long-term memory, something from childhood or, or early development. Um, some people can feel like they experience ego death or ego loss. They completely and I've had this myself, completely lose the entire sense of self whatsoever uh, and just sort of become enmeshed in like pure experience, which can be a very, you know, transcendental and, and mystical experience that can have some long-term benefits for people. Um, uh, but it's still pretty you know, indescribable and, you know, depending on the dosage and depth of therapeutic experience can have, you know, dramatically different effects for people well, yeah. from like a light meditation to a, you know, full blown ego death experience. Ego death is, I think the hardest thing to describe, you know, I think it's when you picture, when you say you go into your own mind and a bunch of doors are available to you. And as you walk through them, different memories come to you, potentially repressed memories or hard memories, but you can approach them more lovingly because you're on ketamine. I think that's mm -hmm. that people understand that. I think ego death is actually literally indescribable because then you stop existing. Uh, so the way I think about it, I'll, I'll give you an example of an ego death experience I had. This was actually on, um, on, ke on prescribed ketamine therapy done through intramuscular injection. It's like a quick little insulin needle shot in the arm. Um, uh, I, throughout the experience, um, was going through a lot of different memories and a lot of, especially on ketamine, which is a dissociative, uh, one of the benefits potentially is they can help like really break down associations to different ideas or structures and help you see them with fresh eyes. That's kind of sort of that neuroplastic thing we just talked about, right? You're mm -hmm. making new connections. And so you're able to, you know, re see things from a whole new perspective and like rebuild them from the ground up. Um, the downside of a dissociative can be a little like jarring and confusing. <laughs> so, yeah, that's sort of the, the, the two sides of that coin. Um, I had one experience where I was, uh, I had experienced ego death and throughout the experience, I'd literally forgotten that I was a human being and just like purely experiencing what was coming up. Um, so shapes, colors, sort of memories, associations, um, sort of creative thoughts. Uh, and as I, maybe towards the end of the experience, started piecing it all together, I started like scratching at the surface of like, wait, well, like, what am I doing? Like, who am I? And then all of a sudden my, my name came like flashing through in lights, Dylan. And I was like, oh, right, I'm, I'm Dylan. <laughs> I'm a human being and, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, every, you know, thing in my life sort of reassembled itself. Um, and so that can, you know, be pretty intense for people, but it can also be really cathartic for people to get out of their heads and especially for people with anxiety or depression to get out of their, their ruminations and get a break from that and be able to sort of reset, you know, um, their thought patterns. Because for a lot of people, they're just stuck in, you know, these ruminations around anxiety, depression, they just go over and over and reinforce themselves deeper and deeper. Sure. And yeah. Got, well, you go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say you, you bring up a question that I've always had about ketamine, which is right now, obviously psilocybin and MDMA, ayahuasca, all these things are illegal. You can't really get access to them without breaking the law in a world in the future where everything is legalized. Where does ketamine fit in terms of the options for people? Like who if there is legal MDMA, psilocybin, ayahuasca, ibogaine, DMT, and ketamine, mm -hmm. like who would you say ketamine is specifically for? Who should pick ketamine of all those options? Is it, is it meant for people with a certain background, PTSD, depression, something like that? Like how do you see it fitting into the ultimate suite of psychedelics? Mm. And there are a few directions. Uh, one is that uh, ketamine, I f well, I think there's a couple. Uh, one, despite, I think, some of the sort of preconceived uh, viewpoints on it, like you said, the sort of horse tranquilizer, yeah, yeah. Um, which is technically false. It's a horse anesthetic. <laughs> Get <laughs> it right, guys. It. Yeah, uh, but it's, it's also an anesthetic that's used in the emergency room of every hospital in the United States. Uh, so it's, it's on the World Health Organization's list of world's most essential medicines because it's one of the safest anesthetics and analgesics that we have. Um, but it definitely has that as a reputation as the, as the horse tranquilizer. 
So despite that, it's actually a pretty light experience for people. And so it was a pretty good sort of um, starter psychedelic medicine to get people accustomed to an altered state of consciousness. Uh, if you were, you know, starting people off, some people might start with like holotropic breath work to see how they handle an altered state. Um, some people, they might move to like um, ketamine, maybe MDMA, uh, before getting into psilocybin or LSD and ultimately, you know, DMT and ayahuasca, which are very incredibly intense experiences. Uh, in addition to, you know, maybe where it's at on the you know, intensity or, I don't know, skill curve, um, it also is, has a really short duration. Uh, so MDMA, you know, can last like, um, you know, three, but really if you're doing it therapeutically, you might do it twice, like four to six, seven hours. Mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin, pretty similar. Uh, you know, LSD can be like six to 12. Um, ketamine lasts about an hour. Uh, sometimes as, as short as like 30 to 45 minutes if you're doing it through IV or intramuscular injection. Uh, and so that can be pretty accessible for people if they need to access these things more frequently. So if you have anxiety or depression and something you're working on consistently and you need to be able to dive into something like this ad hoc, you know, without taking up a whole day and needing to find somebody to support you in person, uh, ketamine can, you know, can be effective for that. Um, one of my viewpoints too, um, which I don't know if this is backed by any like clinical research yet, uh, although Mindbloom is running what I think it's going to be the, one of the biggest uh, clinical studies in psychedelic history right now nice. uh, on our patient population. Yeah. Um, is that because ketamine has works on the glutamate system as an antagonist versus the serotonin system as an agonist, so it kind of cuts off the system, mm -hmm. uh, it has these like out of body um, subjective experiences and effects. Uh, so I think it can also be really effective for people who have a mindfulness practice. Because um, you, if you are able to sort of surf the ketamine experience and let go, uh, you can go pretty deep into the experience, even at like a pretty light or medium therapeutic dose. Um, you know, whereas some other serotonogenic psychedelics, you know, mindfulness and being able to navigate the experience can be helpful, but you're kind of like strapped to a rocket ship and yeah. along for the ride. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, um, in addition, um, you know, ketamine doesn't seem to have some of the like neurotoxicity of say like MDMA. Um, and because it's a little more accessible for people who are looking to, I think, drive behavioral change, I think what we're going to see is my hypothesis is that when we really figure out how to apply ketamine as a neurotechnology, uh, I think it's going to be one of the even more effective medicines to help drive long-term behavioral change for people because it's creating this three to 14 day neuroplastic window potentially. Uh, and so, you know, mind bloom, for instance, we give people six sessions over like one to three months. And I think they can compound on each other because people are sort of stacking these neuroplastic windows as they're trying to make changes in their life. Whereas with something like psilocybin, you're kind of giving somebody a, you know, a, a jolt and, you know, hoping that that can really reset them and, and put them on the right path, which, which clinical research shows that it does. Yeah. But well, yeah. you, you actually were the first person that uh, brought this up. It, isn't there a limit to basically how many good MDMA experiences you get before your body adapts to it? Hmm. Yeah, it's quite colloquially known as losing the magic. So after a certain amount of MDMA experiences, there seems to be, especially with MDMA, a significant amount of long-term tolerance that develops. Um, and we don't really know why. It might just be like the brain, you know, sort of becoming rigid and, you know, realizing like, what's going on yeah. um, and, and just sort of like building that tolerance. We see that with a lot of drugs. Uh, there's also, it seems to be some cross tolerance across psychedelics, even with alcohol, like people who... Um, drink or al like alcoholics or drink a lot of alcohol in general are less sensitive and have more oh. tolerance even to things like psychedelics. Uh, there's some research around cross tolerance of all these things and long-term tolerance. So yeah, you, if, that's why I don't do MDMA for funsies anymore. I didn't realize that every time I did it for fun, it would cost me the ability to do it therapeutically down the line. <laughs> yeah. No, no free lunches. <laughs> yeah. What was the question you were going to ask, Joe? Uh, well, it might take us away, but I yeah, go for it. I'll I'll actually stick on this just for a second because you had asked. I'll give you my subjective perspective on ketamine because we've done it. I've done ketamine now. I did it. Sat in your office when you guys were doing it in office. Did it the uh, the gravity chair with the gravity blanket. Listen to a Sam Harris YouTube video. That, and that's then, my living room now. <laughs> and uh, then I got four doses from you, which I did in my my own place. So, and then a facilitator gave me ketamine while I was on an MDMA based experience. So just just based on that, I can say that you mentioned the shortness of ketamine is nice. So I was in MDMA feeling a bit stuck 
in the moment and she she introduced a little bit of ketamine which you know there's there's constraints on how much your body can take it's a very short like deepener in that mdma experience which allows you sort of to move through things so i think that that has space uh at home you mentioned to me and i'm curious what you think the one that i've been most impressed by and can most widely recommend presuming legality would be mdma uh in terms of the profundity of its impact and those sorts of things uh ayahuasca i see as much more challenging and difficult and now no longer recommend to beginners even though i did it as a total novice (laughs) (laughs) like that is not the one that i recommend people start with even though that was all i was familiar with and ketamine today i recommend for people who are uh fearful of the legality of it want something that they can try at home specifically anxiety or something like that and want a um a quick taste of what of what it can be but i still see not to not to say one is better or worse if i could only give somebody one knowing a broad just a little bit about them it would likely be mdma as mind bloom expands not to ask you to pick a favorite but where do, what do you see being like the backbone or the structure of how people heal evolve those kind of things i know we've kind of been talking about this but i want to talk outside of just ketamine like what is the mm. what is the cornucopia of psychedelic uh, treatment look like in your mind because you are someone that actually i think introduce us to ayahuasca right you you're the guy that that did it all <laughs> in terms of bringing oh, us yeah, into Dylan's, this world Dill's the godfather a lot <laughs> yeah. of people a lot of people have Dylan to thank for their first psychedelic experience yes uh to to answer your question directly I mean, mdma changed my life yeah i, I mean mdma especially for people who are cognizers so people who are maybe uh, process the world more through their heads and not you know their emotions yeah. i think at least in my experience and from seeing other people do it um, and looking at like what the actual you know, neurochemical and pharmacological effects are, like it's can be a life-changing experience. Uh, for me, when I was uh, in you know my late teens, early 20s, I like, grew up with a family with a lot of mental illness and sort of a turbulent home and was super achievement oriented and got out and you know, went to a top school and was the first person in my family to go to college and thought I had it all figured out started studying positive psychology and learned that I was like very miserable. (laughs) I was both miserable, but also like a miserable person. Like I was not friendly. I was not nice. I had friends, but I was tribal. I didn't like humanity and the world. And I didn't like people if I met them. I looked at them through a filter of like why I wouldn't like them. Uh, And I had a friend who, you know, pushed me to try MDMA. uh, And I grew up in the attic to my house, my mom. And so I was really terrified of, you know, illegal drugs, but thought something had to change. And I really trusted them. And it like totally catalyzed for me a complete, you know, emotional transformation into being someone who could could be a, an optimist and could be someone who related to others in the world and liked humans and humanity. When was uh, so that? Then, when did you do that? Uh, it was like twelve or thirteen years ago. Like nineteen twenty. Yeah. So I'm just curious because I saw I saw <laughs> the tra- I saw the transformation. Dylan used to get in fist fights with friends just because yeah. you were so you just had a lot of that rage in you. I think because for people who don't know, you had a very tough upbringing you know you mentioned your mom was an addict and uh I, it was uh noticeable amongst the friend group like the giant personal transformation you had into somebody who was loving complimentary hugged friends a really positive from someone who was at first very i think angry because of yeah the situation you grew right. up in i didn't identify myself as somebody who had a lot of anger but when it once it melts away you see like whoa you know was it i think Nabal ravikant has this quote about like Anger is like holding a hot coal waiting to throw it at somebody else. Mm-hmm. You're like, you're the one experiencing all this pain yeah. inside, just directing it at somebody who doesn't even know. And you're like, just going around. I mean, literally your internal world is a maelstrom for no reason. Uh, and so, you know, MDMA for me was really powerful because all of a sudden for the first time, I felt this like deep empathogenic or emotional connection to other people. I like loved people for the sake of just being people mm-hmm. and I started to connect with people. Uh, and it wasn't overnight, but yeah, I mean, it was l- literally life changing. I wouldn't be who I am or where I am without that. And then these other psychedelic medicines have helped me also both continue to reinforce how important my relationships are and my connections to people. Like we're social animals, and mm-hmm. you know, if you decide you're going to be a prior, and you know, you might just have your tribe, but you're going to like, you know, do it all on your own. You can't get very far. You're not, you're not going to accomplish anything very challenging or complex in this world if you can't organize and collaborate. Uh, and partner up with other people. And that was definitely the path that I was going on. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then, you know, I think they also, for me, have really reinforced a lot of perspective. So, I mean, I don't want to call them like mental models, but there's so many moments throughout my day where I like stop and regain perspective on something. Sure. Uh, so like, you know, say um, somebody cuts me off in traffic, like the moment I get angry, I like stop and think about Hanlon's razor and the fundamental attribution bias, if you're familiar. So like Hanlon's razor is the idea that like don't attribute uh, to malice or you know malcontent what can be attributed to just like, you know, ignorance or incompetence. Sure. Yeah, and or even fun. even the fact that person might have a pregnant wife in the car. That's mm -hmm. that's something I always try yeah. for. It's like, okay, this person cut me off. Maybe it's because they're a dick, or maybe it's because someone they love is dying, or some. You know what I mean? They're just on some on a more important journey than I am while I go surfing or to the grocery store or whatever. Totally. I, go ahead. I don't want to cut this off. I have I have uh, another direction. Well, I was just saying the fundamental attribution bias is the idea that every time you have a success you're like, oh, it's because I'm really skillful, right? Like, I'm the man. And every time you have a failure, you're like, oh, I got unlucky. Or you know, <laughs> anytime, you cut, anytime you cut somebody off, you're like, well, I'm just busy. That, yeah. That's a mistake. That's an outlier situation, you know? And vice versa, anytime someone else is successful, you're like, oh, they got lucky. Anytime they fail, you're like, yeah, it's because they're you know, not competent. <laughs> they're not skillful. And same thing with, like, their behavior. And so when you realize you're, like, always running these, like, broken, you know, programs through your head, and there are so many of these around, like, gratitude and, you know, realizing, like, just how lucky we are to be alive and experience the richness of reality and just how abundant and free we are, you know, even when you feel like you don't have something. Mm -hmm. um, you know, psychedelics have helped me see those things and continue to, like, reinforce those behaviors and patterns uh, in a way that's been, you know, uh, profound and life-changing and helped me go from, you know, a dick <laughs> and, <laughs> and a pessimist and someone who's just unhappy to someone who's who's not but yeah you know, it's been a lot of work along the way but you guys are also you know on the path absolutely man wearing mind bloom shirts working on it still <laughs> working on it still i i wanted to ask you so you you obviously partially as a function of your job but also as long as i've known you you've been really into the science of all of this uh you've you, you, you can know. say it i'm a nerd well beyond nerd you're <laughs> th that that aspect of it has always fascinated you and for me uh, I don't know that it has, even though I'm a nerd. Uh, recently, I would say that I have become not just open, but uh, have moved towards the likelihood in my mind that these psychedelic experiences point to some deeper metaphysical truths, that it is not just I am an evolved monkey whose brain is being distorted, which is a word that you use, but I don't know, I don't know that that's the entirety of how you feel about it, but that it is perhaps even removing some of the distortions and taking me closer or into a deeper level of reality. So I'm curious, because I do think that these things can be paired together. Do you see this as purely a, a material phenomena that allows you to become an optimist and see things in a different way, but fundamentally the, the building blocks of the world are still atoms and material substances? Or do you think that these point to some sort of metaphysical truth perhaps that everything is consciousness or that people have souls or that fundamentally everything is love some of the things that you might read in woo-woo books mm -hmm. I'm I, I don't actually know what you where you stand on that hmm so i definitely believe that psychedelics reveal truths uh that they help us sort of see things from this fresh pure perspective and there are reasons that psychedelics have these motifs for people that come up over and over again, right? Love, mortality, the preciousness of life, the preciousness of our relationships. These things are like atavistic, right? They're like primal. They're like, they feel like deep in, what's the word, noetic, like this deep feeling of truth and knowing. Uh, and it, they don't, you know, they might fade a little bit, but they don't like fade away. They stick with you and they stick with people for a reason. Um, and you've seen people who you know, I've seen people who've done too many psychedelics. We call the psychedelic Turing test. Like, can you tell if someone's <laughs> done too much, too many psychedelics, and how quickly? <laughs> based on the, how many questions you can ask them? Um, but I've seen so many people who have, you know, tapped into these uh, therapies and medicines and tools that have, you know, had profound transformations that have made them significantly, you know, better, smarter, healthier for them and others. Um, so I do think that it unlocks and sort of gives you perspective into these like fundamental truths. Uh, one, one example is, you know, one of the best practices of psychedelics is to go in with an intention. You can write it out, you can think about it, but something to prime your subconscious that you want to explore or work on, maybe somewhere where you want to get unstuck. That was a good word you used earlier, um, or something, you know, you're looking for insight into. 
But most of the time, the insights that come up are like totally different than your intention. Sure. And you go, oh, Always. that was what I thought I wanted to work on. Yeah. That was surface level. There's something way deeper here that I'm supposed to be working on. Mm -hmm. Like I thought I wanted like some career insight. No, I need to like have good relationships with my colleagues. Like I'm on this journey to build something with other people, like my tribe. We're out there hunting or gathering or whatever. And I'm like worried about having some breakthrough in marketing or whatever. Like yeah. I should be worried about having these incredible, meaningful relationships with the people I'm actually building with. Um, you know, it's like an example of something that comes up for me sometimes related to a bunch of things is the importance of my connections. Um, so I do believe that on the sort of other end of the spectrum, I think you might be like alluding to what some people call like transpersonal psychology. Sure. Uh, this idea that maybe our, there's a lot of different sort of viewpoints on transpersonal psychology, but say one school of thought is like our minds are receivers for some sort of reality. Uh, and there might be some underlying field, just like the Higgs boson field or other subatomic particles or quantum mechanics, you know, things that we know about today that if you told people about 100 years ago, they would say, you're nuts <laughs> if you believe that, right? Um, and maybe when you take a psychedelic, it changes how we receive, you know, different, you know, real physical or quantum forces in the universe. And maybe one of those is consciousness. And so we're like literally tuning in to a different frequency of consciousness or, or vibrations or frequencies or, or something that sounds really woo-woo, but sort of, like we said, quantum mechanics, right? Um, I don't, I'm open to it. I have definitely seen things on psychedelic experiences that are hard to explain. Um, I think if you've had deep psychedelic experiences, you have perceived energy in a different way. I don't mean like maybe some people I think might say frequencies or vibrations, but you can just see energy like vibrate off of people or like resonate. So if you're in a group, for instance, I've had this experience personally where I've been in a group and maybe somebody does something that off in the distance that a group doesn't like, you can almost like see the ripple effects of people reacting to somebody else in this way that feels like very deep and intuitive. And so you do feel like you've sort of opened so the doors of perception, it's Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception, and you can just perceive so much more. Um, I'm not quite ready to believe that we're like stepping into a spirit world in like a shamanic way, or, you know, that our brains are like receivers for consciousness, but, man, there's so much about the universe that we don't know. We're like infinitely big, right? We have like 40 trillion, 30 trillion cells, 40 trillion bacteria, 300 mm -hmm. trillion viruses in us, subatomic particles, we keep discovering more and more. And we're also infinitely small, right? There are like, what, 100 billion stars in our galaxy, and like 100 billion galaxies. Uh, you know, we keep finding that there are more and more habitable planets out there. Like, and who knows, maybe there's also an endless amount of, you know, simulations or multiverses. Uh, so the idea that there's something more that you're tapping into, I'm open to it, but not quite ready to, to believe. Yeah, and it sounds like you're still uh, coming from it more from a scientific perspective in the sense that it's similar to quantum physics. It's an energy field that maybe we can't uh, perceive because of the frequency and then our eyes change because we've taken the substance versus other people I've heard of. I'm not saying right or wrong, but they'll take psychedelics and they'll think that they are uh, reliving past lives because they have a eternal soul that is going to go to a, maybe not a heaven, but a tr more traditional afterlife or, or uh, reconvene with um, God that they themselves are part of God more in the sense of a eternal being kind of Judeo-Christian, although not necessarily wedded to the Bible. It sounds like you're mm -hmm. closer to the idea that uh, it, it's more based on when you take this, a chemical reaction occurs in your brain and maybe that gives you access to different visual energies, but not so much that when you take this, it releases your spirit into the spiritual world. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Am I getting yeah. your, am I understanding you correctly? So I was kind of sort of commenting on the idea of transpersonal psychology. I would, so for me, psychedelics are I'm deeply spiritual. I don't like the word spiritual. It's like low resolution. Whatever's in my head when I say spiritual is different than in your head. Mm -hmm. So we're not actually like communicating. For sure. But I, I, it's deeply meaningful and ontological for me. Um, I, when I do psychedelics often, I tap into the sense of like awe and wonder and like beauty and like the preciousness of life and like reality and how lucky I am. Uh, gratitude. Like, uh, you know, oftentimes it'll, with a lot of different medicines, it'll you know, make me feel so grateful and connected that mm -hmm. I like will cry. Mm -hmm. So literally the only time that 
I do. I can think of. Um, um, I do think that there's like so much more to the universe and psychedelics help remind me of that, remind me about how big it all is Mm -hmm. and how like precious it is. Uh, but I think that I would, it would be like hubris for me to say like what those things are. Cause there's like no e evidence. Sure. So past lives are an example. So some people might have that experience for me without seeing any evidence. It's hard for me to buy that. Uh, I more just sit there feeling almost like a dumb ape at how big and wonderful mm. and mysterious the universe is and how lucky I am to get to experience it, uh, but also a little bittersweet and how tragic it is that I'll never really understand it. Sure. So. No, and I think there's another another maybe easier way to think about it is that people will take these substances and then they have deep, profound truths that were hidden to them revealed to them maybe about themselves or how their childhood impacted them or the way that they interact in the world and the way that they're without realizing it ruining their relationships or something like that. And then the question is, did that come from clearing away all of the self-deception, removing the ego and your own mind populates this truth that you've known all along, but been hiding from yourself because of all your trauma, because of all your junk, or are you opening your consciousness to a omniscient universal consciousness and then the term people use is downloading this mm -hmm. information from an external source and in either case it doesn't it doesn't diminish the validity of the truth and it also doesn't diminish how far you were from it before taking the psychedelic but i do see a divide in psychedelic users in terms of if they think it came from that first internal experience i described or that second external I think experience i, don't, I actually Can I, can I chime in real quick? I think that that might be a bit of a false dichotomy that presumes that you are contained inside of your skin mm -hmm. and therefore anything that came from outside of that would be outside of you. I suppose the, the people that feel like they got downloads and, I, and sometimes I consider myself in that group, it's, more, it's not necessarily that I got a download, it's that I am bigger than I have realized. That there is, uh, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know what to say. Uh, if, if there is an ego death and something remains, that that something is not simply contained in the synapses of my brain and my suit, and in fact could even persist upon the cessation of electrical activity in my brain. Okay. Um, so yes, it's a download from out there, but it's like, but I was out there all along. I just didn't know it. So well, yeah, this, I mean, I'm curious to have you and Dylan and I, we can talk sure, about it. I think sure. I imagine that we all have different uh, ideas yeah. of, of the metaphysical truth revealed to us from psychedelics. Here's, here's maybe a good litmus test here have or even like well yeah maybe even rorschach test have have you guys um smoked an ndmt or 5-meo dmt oh yeah <laughs> yes okay so that's the scariest thing you, i've ever done in my life yeah um on an ndmt uh you know oftentimes one of the motifs that people experience are meeting entities or the machine elves maybe mm -hmm. people have heard about that uh have you had the experience of you know communing or meeting with entities or machine elves I've had entities uh, via ayahuasca, but I've never got the machine elves. No, I'm never, I'm never the machine elves either. Well, do you think you're actually? <laughs> here's, here's a good question. Do you think you're actually meeting entities? Or do you think that those are actual entities, or do you think that they're, you know, sort of, a, I don't want to say a figment of the imagination, but some sort of cognitive construct that, mm -hmm. you know, people often experience when yeah. you know, these molecules are interacting with their brain chemistry in a certain way? Well, so, I think Charlie and I probably disagree. Yeah, I put. Here's the best way I can describe it. When it was happening, it was 100% positive. This was an entity. Like and mm -hmm. and uh, there was no there would be no convincing me otherwise. The day after and days I realized or saw that no that was not in fact the case. This was just my own mind constructing things. Uh, now years later, having done several psychedelic experiences and realizing that this the state that I am currently in often dictates what I perceive as real. So last night when I was dreaming that I was you know whatever I'm making this up on a date with Cindy Crawford, I was totally convinced. And this morning I'm not. Uh, young, young Cindy or current Cindy? <laughs> current, the one, current Cindy. <laughs> the one that I remember from my childhood. Current Cindy. <laughs> um, what I, what, there, I have a, a, a bias towards uh, the reality of the state that, am I, that I am in without uh, accounting for the fact that you are asking me this in an ordinary waking state of consciousness. And so I am now, uh, I now create more space in my possibility actuarial mm -hmm. tables for like no it was that was a real entity that 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 spoke to me and was not a hallucination or something yeah. like that i often so, and again i actually don't 
I, uh, I, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, would not propose to know that you are wrong. I think mm-hmm. it is in, uh, I don't know if it's coincidence or not that your first experience was ayahuasca, which is so intense. And I wonder if the fact that I had previously smoked weed, had previously taken psilocybin with my eyes open and then wandered around a beach in Bali, had previously done MDMA at a concert, uh, had had like had baby stepped my way there such that when I was doing ayahuasca, I was like, oh, this is similar to an experience I've had. Whereas if you're, let's say a random person wandering the desert and you've never had any, you're just completely sober your whole life and then you smoke DMT, it's going to feel very, very, very much more so that you just communed with God because you have no reference experiences to possibly compare that to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, and and I guess I, I don't think that that's actually it, because um, I didn't in my waking life I didn't speak about any or think about any of these things as real until years later. At which point I had done a softer ketamine, a softer psilocybin. Um, it, truly, it was probably on my eighth ayahuasca experience that I had that, exp- and then even past that. So it's been, it was years, only years later do I, do I have that Oh, really? I remember you doing it right after the first time you did DMT. No, yes, right at, the day after. But if you'd asked me two weeks after that what I thought of it, I would have said, no, no, that was not the case. Do you um, think you have a, a mystically prone brain? Have you read, you, you've read uh, Stealing Fire, right? Yes. By Stephen Cotland, yes. Jamie Wheel. Yeah. And talk about the DIY God helmet, right? Where <laughs> uh, you can go on Reddit and you can download instructions to create like a two hundred and fifty dollar, I think, like helmet that will send a. I don't know if it's like transcranial magnetic stimulation, but some sort of uh, current through your brain at the point of your brain that seems to be where the feeling of mystical experiences live, and it will induce this like profound, almost like paternalistic, like up, you know, top Wait, really? down. This is a genuine thing you can create. mm Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, I I haven't done it myself, so I have not verified I've never it. Never heard of this, but uh, I I trust the guys who are at Stealing Fire. They think they know what's up, um, uh, and I think after reading that, one of the things I've I've sort of a hypothesis I've developed and I think observed is that some people have just more mystically prone brains. So just like my you know biology and, and neurochemistry is like more prone to perceiving and processing the world through thoughts than emotions, sort of like you know sort of hallmark. Uh, mentioned a lot of personality tests. Uh, I think I have seen and met a lot of people who just seem to be mystically oriented. Mm-hmm. And we have a, a mutual friend. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be comfortable, so I'm not going to name him, but he <laughs> had, you know, his first psychedelic experience was on ayahuasca. He was, yep. um, you know, Christian and it was not, most of his friends, nearly all of his friends were not Christian. Mm-hmm. So it was always interesting. He went to the incredible school, very, um, I don't know, uh, curious, but he was, you know, clearly has like a deep mystical connection to something greater and something spiritual and religious. And he had the most intense uh, psychedelic experience I'd ever even witnessed or heard of. Mm-hmm. He like orgasmed in his pants. <laughs> he was like shaking maniacally for hours. It's like quite disconcerting uh, and came out the other end, no longer believing in a Judeo Christian God. But now on some on a deep, deep spiritual path, believing in you know frequencies and vibrations and sure. stuff, chakras and um, some stuff that he you know is, is sort of a, a different type of spirituality. I think he just has a mystically oriented brain, <laughs> um, whereas you know maybe maybe I do not. Um, do you think you have a mystically oriented brain? Like where do you think you, you fall in that spectrum? I don't know. Um, I do think that uh, one of the th- that that that. Supposing that the foundation of all of this is in the brain is is to presuppose a materialist worldview. So it's tough to like, if I if I grant that yes, I have a mystically oriented brain, then I have granted that right, the, the count, substrate the of this. Argument, is that, the counter argument would be that like, that person <laughs> that, just that, has that, more access to the truth. Or, well, that that the brain is not the substrate of what is right is not or not the only substrate of it. And I totally grant that there's the level of, well, of reality which I most often interact on is the same as you and you and uh it is not as a soul or as a uh pure consciousness or anything like that so do mm-hmm. i have a more instantly i think probably you could say that you could probably um locate a part of my brain that was perhaps more similar to part of his brain the question is whether that is an effect or a cause meaning like if the substrate of the entire universe is pure consciousness and it's a dream as the you know i, I call him woo woo but some of the mystics say and i i would be then 
all of consciousness dreaming of Charlie that had a brain that looked like that other person's brain. And we look at it and go, oh, look, that's why he's having this experience. But the question is whether that is an effect of pure consciousness or the cause of mm-hmm. what is simply a um, an experience. Yeah, I don't and, think we'll get to I don't think we'll get to a conclusion, obviously. Oh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. But- yeah, yeah, I don't know. Oh, we're going to get to a conclusion by the end of this podcast. <laughs> Solve metaphysics forever. <laughs> Done. Complete. Um, so, I, yeah, well, let's stay on this. I was I, There's other questions that I want to ask you that are, like, literally about your previous business because I've always been interested in that. We haven't had a chance to talk, but I want to I want to stick with this if there's if there's more that you guys wanted to mention. I guess the big thing is, and I'll, and I'll plug for you, um, you guys do telemedicine. Is it in all 50 states? Uh, we're currently in... I believe about 14 states reaching half the U.S. population. We'll be in over 30 by the end of the year. Got it. So what big, states? New York, California. I mean, you know them. Do I know them? <laughs> Pop quiz. <laughs> uh, what are the big we're ones? In, you can go to mindbloom.com sure. and you can fill out a survey and see if we're in your state. <laughs> uh, we're in, uh, I believe, California, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, where I just moved, Yeehaw, uh, New York, <laughs> where I moved from, um, Florida, um, it gets a little fuzzy after that. Sure. And and my you got, do you have an Oregon or a Washington in there? They love psychedelics. Um, I be, I do not know. We're we're it's 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 sort of a, a dynamic. It's it's a little dynamic because it's based on the clinicians that we have licensed in those states. Mm. Um, and so we're constantly growing and expanding our clinical network. And sometimes clinicians, you know, like go off and treat elsewhere. And we're getting our clinicians cross licensed in other states right now. So we've had a couple of states that have had to go on pause and a couple that come online pretty frequently. Yeah. Is this a legal nightmare to try to run? Uh, Your mutual friends with our head of clinical operations, Jack. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not if you have Jack around the table. Oh, nice. <laughs> He's killing it. Yeah. So, one of, yeah, Dylan. One, you, one, one of the great, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say you're, you're an absolute, uh, you go against the grain in the sense that you hired your best friend and your wife to leave their jobs to come to your startup. Oh, oh yeah, and you're up, one of your best friends from college, the guy that officiated your wedding, right? Yeah, I hired the best man at my wedding, the person who officiated my wedding, and my wife. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bold strategy. Uh, now you're all in it together. No diversification. Well, as, there's a few few reasons I felt comfortable with it. Uh, one is that you know seeing broader acceptance and access of psychedelics for people has been a change that all of us have like most wanted to see in the world our entire adult lives. So it's been one of the top ones mm-hmm. for it's been num- my number one and top one for some of my friends. Um, uh, two is we've all done like a lot of work on ourselves and psychedelics have been a major part of that. Uh, so we have a culture of mind bloom. We have, um, over a hundred people here now, and we're going to have probably several hundred more over the next 12 to 18 months. We're growing really quickly. Uh, and everyone here is mission obsessed with psychedelic medicine. And we've also built this culture, uh, that really prizes intellectual honesty and really being focused on our clients and creating transformational outcomes for them. Uh, so we don't hire people with egos. So yep. we don't we, we you know we we don't have a lot of titles. You're either a head of a lead or a t- you know your role. Um, and if you're really fixated on your ego and can't like give yourself up to like the mission a little bit, then it's not a fit. Yeah. Well, so you're you're also person- you're not a broke uh, out of the basement startup. Like you know, the, I think those people left their jobs to come with you because they believe in the mission. But also, you guys have some some. Uh, serious investors and advisors behind you. You know, people might hear us talking and be like, oh, this is just Ben's friend from college. But it's like, you have a, a network of advisors and uh, funds and angel investors behind you that add some serious credibility to what you're doing. Yeah, we're, we're backed by Peer Tail and Founders Fund and the healthcare group at 8VC, which like top five VCs. And, um, and I've, yeah, raised hundreds of millions, over $100 million across a few companies and yeah. had an acquisition. Um, just so people listening aren't like, oh yeah, this is just Ben's friend who ships ketamine out of his basement. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, I think those those people probably they didn't leave day one. Day one, you started it, and then you built up a beta, and then you had an office in New York, and then you got Peter Thiel involved, and then you raised money, and you got advisors, and throughout the over the course of it, people got I think, excited about what you're doing and jumped in to join you throughout in various phases. Yeah, I think it was just me for about six months. Yeah. Which was, which was pretty fun. <laughs> it gets, uh, it's a little, it's a little frustrating going from because because my last company, Mighty, is one of the leaders in its space. We raised over, um, I think now the company's raised over 140 million dollars or so. Um, and going from you know having uh, product to market, marketing, you know, team engineers to then just you. And like you're like, oh, if I like don't work a day or an hour, like literally nothing gets done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like literally taking like a snowflake and trying to get a snowball rolling. It takes a it takes a little while and a like, sort of a Herculean effort, but uh, it's pretty cool once you know once it starts going and you start hiring people and they start contributing. Yeah, and then once you're and done not, making the not pizza, much job doesn't really doesn't really matter. Like, <laughs> so go ahead. No, I was just saying it's like that book. Then once you're done making the food, people show up to eat with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure everybody's been super helpful. Yeah, um, no, it I, helps that they're all also really smart and all went to very good schools and all that stuff. Sure. Go ahead. You, I, you I had a question wanna, about. Uh, well, I, I want right? to I want to uh, pointedly give my subjective recommendation just to for who for who this is for. So I said before if. If I, uh, to those listening without knowing anything about you, one, be very careful with any substance. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, if you have a history of, and you guys screen for this stuff on your website as well, but yeah. uh, screen out things that could be dangerous, history of schizophrenia, all that kind of stuff. If you are in a healthy group and are working on yourself, to me, cost agnostic, the number one thing that, and legality agnostic, number one thing I'd recommend is MDMA with a facilitator. Mm -hmm. But that, you, can't, you can't get that... That's you expensive. Can't, you can't get it legally in <laughs> the it's, U.S. And it's illegal. Um, so, but th that is my number one recommendation. And then I think there's a, a big space for ketamine, particularly for those people who um, would like to, something they could do at home. It is legal. It's going, to, if you've listened to our podcast and you've wondered what we're talking about, this will dip your toe into the pool. It will, can actually give you a very deep experience on ketamine. And it is very unlikely to go to have some sort of negative experience like I have described on ayahuasca or 5-MeO-DMT. The disassociative properties of it make it comfortable, uh, which is why I think it's generally, you know, not just physically safe for people to do at home, but psychologically is is much yeah. more safe yeah. than, say, ayahuasca would be to do at home alone in your bed. Yeah, I think especially for people, I mean, honestly, it's funny because it's for partially for people who have anxious uh, patterns, but if you're someone who has anxiety around psychedelics, it's a good way to start because to your point, it is an hour. It is legal. You have clinical people that they talk to beforehand. Uh, yeah. And so I think it's a lot less daunting than going to Peru to do ayahuasca in the mountains with a bunch of strangers and a shaman you just met for eight hours for three days in a row, uh, yeah. I mean, which I think it, some people love, but I think that's a very, that's biting off quite a lot for a first psychedelic experience. Yeah. I mean, there's data on it too. So like at mind bloom, like 90, 80 to 90% of people who have anxiety and depression symptoms who are going through treatment uh, have a clinically effective response to it. So that's like a meaningful improvement in anxiety or depression scores based on established scales. By comparison, an SSRI like Lexapro or Prozac has like a 40 to 47% a clinically effective response for people. Mm. Um, and in addition, it works right away. And the, less than 5% of our clients have had any side effects whatsoever. And they're mostly like nausea or some discomfort or grogginess the next day. Uh, and we've had um, no like major adverse events across you know, tens of thousands of sessions now over the past year. Wow. And our clinicians have in their own private practices also done thousands and thousands of sessions. Um, so to your point, it, you know, I think it sounds a little scary and different and weird, but when you actually dig into like the clinical research and safety, we see is that it's pretty safe. Do you go? Oh, and just so people know, you um you might send these, but it's this is a tablet that dissolves in your mouth. I know that people probably heard you say mm -hmm. intramuscular stuff. You don't have to do, and, and I did not do any needles or anything like that. You take a tablet, it dissolves in your yeah. mouth for like seven it's minutes, good. and then you spit it out. It's like a nice little bloom box now. Oh. It's a little physical <laughs> kid with eye mask and notebook and everything. It's I don't know, that, that looked like an advertisement. <laughs> if like, you are on oh, medication, we we're now delivering these to clients. And before it was like pretty janky. It was like a bunch of stuff jammed in an envelope. Every, you know, people would open it up, and every you know, I was just I was embarrassed about it. So, uh, if you, you are guys, on medication, you for, on my bloom box list. Come, 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 come to you. If you are on medication for anxiety or for depression, mm -hmm. do you go off of it to go to take ketamine? Do you go off the SSRI? How do That's you how thing. do you work with people who are already having treatment for this stuff? Yeah, one of the benefits of ketamine is that it's because it's it's like really kind of easy and safe to prescribe. Uh, so if you're a psychiatric clinician, whether you're a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner, like part of the hard part is figuring out like your cocktail of medicine. Mm -hmm. So like, what are all the things you try? What are you on now? Oh, you've seen a bunch of people. Let's make like, like really important. I understand what you're on. And they all like contraindicate with each other. Uh, and like 30 to 40 percent of people with depression are treatment resistant to medication. So they'll try like five or 10 over the next year. Most won't work for them. Uh, with ketamine, you don't have to like worry about any of that. Uh, so there are some contraindications around, um, uh, you know, psychosis or 
suicidality at mind bloom, although it, arguably suicide is the best medication you can prescribe to somebody or ketamine is the best medication you can prescribe to someone who is going through a suicidal episode. I was actually recently, I think it was S ketamine was FDA approved for suicidality. Hmm. Um, um, but yeah, if you're on an antidepressant or an anxiolytic, like, like, you know, Xanax, uh, you can actually prescribe and take ketamine without worrying about titrating off and on. Hmm. Um, and a lot of clients of mind bloom, for instance, have, uh, that gone through ketamine therapy and then tapered off of their SSRIs, you know, that wasn't their plan going mm. in. What was the one that our friend took that wrecked him? GABA, gabapentine? I have no idea. What's this GHB, GABA hydroxybutyrate, butyric acid? I don't know. I wish I could remember. He, he went on something to try to help with anxiety and it ended up making his life a lot worse. And then he had to yeah. go, he had to, he couldn't stop cold turkey because it had addictive uh, properties that he wasn't necessarily warned about. So he's trying to wean himself off of it using other properties, you know? And so then all of a sudden mm -hmm. he's sleeping with Ambien and Xanax and, you know, now he's on, now he's on four different pills. But I also think that that's, I, I know who you're talking about and it's important just to, just so none of this is, is painted as perfectly uh panse or safe that part of what occasioned that is he did some heavy psychedelics mm -hmm. that brought stuff up in his life that he did not have the support to handle. And yeah, he, so it, he did ayahuasca. He, he doesn't even know what he did. He did. Oh, that's true. He, he thought he was even taking, know what he, he thought did. he was taking ayahuasca, but he doesn't. Yeah, yeah that's so right. He did some he heavy some duty psychedelics. It, shaman. it raised up a lot of stuff that was giving him problems. He started taking antidepressants. They barely helped. And then he, then he was on this whole cocktail. It took him a long time to get over. So I, with all of this stuff, just because we are speaking so publicly, it is important when you're speaking to a broad audience to be like, this is not 100% safe. That said, uh, within the realm of tolerable risk, if you're experiencing anxiety, it sounds like from my understanding and, and correct me if I'm wrong, the ketamine is one of the safer treatment options. Um, it's definitely more controllable. Well, I guess it depends how you're, how you're taking it. I mean, there's more clinical research on ketamine than I think every other psychedelic medicine combined, because it's the only one that's not a schedule one controlled substance that's illegal. Um, so the, there's enough clinical research that demonstrates its safety and efficacy to, to indicate that it's very safe. Uh, if a lot of the issues with ketamine you see in like really high dose recreational users. So people who are doing like, like literally like a thousand X what people would do if they're going through mind bloom. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a big point is people that go do K holes in nightclubs and, and end up all messed up and they're, they do ketamine. People think, Oh, ketamine, that's dangerous, but they're doing massive quantities relative to what mind bloom would prescribe. Yeah. You also, you can't really like really overdose on ketamine. Um, there have been, I think only like something like 15 recorded overdose deaths in ketamine over the last like 10 years. Uh, and they're all poly drug overdose deaths of so people mixing a bunch of drugs. Um, so it seems to be really safe and well tolerated. I mean, you're literally taking like one fifth to one twentieth of what children are taking in the emergency room yeah. when they when they come in with an issue. Um, the biggest risk on ketamine is really like like getting in the car, falling, mm -hmm. trying to walking up and down stairs. Stay in your bed. But, <laughs> stay, stay, take your take yeah, your Stay in your you bed. generally want to stay in your bed. <laughs> you're like it's your, your, you know, you're a bit sedated. Oh, and dude, I, and I remember <laughs> now. I will say I tried to play Super Smash Brothers because you're because you're right. It's like 45 minutes, and then I finished up, and they were like, "Hey, you want to play Smash?" And I was, I was a slow boy. So it's it's basically 45 minutes till you're up and amb you know ambulant. And maybe another I don't think it was a mind blowing ask you if you want to play Super Smash Brothers. <laughs> no, no, not at no, mind blowing. No. This, this, this is when you said that you said uh, I got the four sent to my house and then no, but, but the prescription <laughs> the prescription is to put on an eye mask, listen to binaural beats in solitary. I remember I even when I was doing it at home, I had somebody watch my dog for me just so even the dog wouldn't be you know jumping on me or licking me. It's it's very much meant to be a, an internal experience where you take away the sensory yeah. what I'm seeing. You take away the sensory. Oh, I'm hearing my neighbors talking. It's meant to be an internal journey. Yeah, actually, I actually think that's that's um, a little bit of a challenge for people is they experience serotonogenic psychedelics that, like we said, like enhance your senses and things are very interactive. Sometimes you try to meditate on like a you know an LSD or psilocybin experience. You close your eyes, you're like, all right, I'm gonna you know just let things happen and achieve nothingness, and all of a sudden you're like, oh no, I'm. This is closing my eyes is like brighter than the sun. <laughs> There's no way I'm gonna be able to meditate like this, even if I'm just trying to, you know, watch and be mindful. It's just too distracting. Uh, but ketamine like cuts off your senses, right? Like at a high enough dose, if I gave it to you, like literally, you know, you'd be sedated, like you, you'd be anesthetized. Um, so I think for a lot of people, they might experience 
ketamine, you know, in a non-clinical setting and not understand that it's you know, really not meant to be like going around interacting with things mm. like it cuts off those senses. And so going inward, you know, lying down, eye shade, really see what comes up from the inner psyche uh, and just letting it happen can be really deeply therapeutic and powerful for people. It's really surprising for people too, if they haven't experienced ketamine in that therapeutic setting, maybe they have experienced it other ways. And then they do experience in a therapeutic setting. You're like, wow, this is completely different than you know, other, other experiences I've had. Yeah. That was even my experience with therapeutic MDMA. I've, I was like less visuals, less wanting to rub certain things. You know, it was, it wasn't that festival experience at all. It was very internal and sober compared to let's say psilocybin and ayahuasca in the sense of knowing who I was and where I was the whole time. And it, it was a much more internal memory based experience for me than, uh, when you're at EDC, I, <laughs> just running I, around I, looking yeah. at lights. I, I have, I have trouble experiencing MDMA in like a, just a pure therapeutic setting. I think I'm anchored to interacting and like journaling and, uh, moving. And I just get like really, um, uh, restless. I'm like, mm -hmm. am I supposed to lay here for like four to six hours? <laughs> like, <what? laughs> Well, I don't do it alone. I don't do it in my bed. You know, I go to a setting with an intention, with a God, with a whatever spiritual guide, shaman, therapist, whatever you want to call it. So the, um, the same, the setting definitely sets me up for success in that way. It's not like I'm just at a friend's house and then I take MDMA and try to go to their guest room <laughs> and then have a six hour internal experience, which I think would be much harder. Yeah, no, I've, I've done in like, I was, I was referring to like doing in like the ceremonial context. I, um, I don't know if this fits here, but I have, I have questions about your, uh, the legal industry and I don't even know if you can talk about this on, on air. So if not, just say no. But, uh, the, the short version of my question is you, you were in, uh, the legal industry, you saw a lot of things. I want to know the, the ugly of, of the legal industry. And if you can't share it totally fine, we can, uh, we can, can scrap all this. It. Okay. So, yeah, so, so, so just quick background. You were, you were part of this thing called money mighty. Uh, what, what did you guys do? Yeah, so, so I co-founded a company called Mighty, uh, which today is still one of the largest providers of like software and services and capital in the $250 billion uh, personal injury legal space. Uh, so every year, millions of people are injured in car accidents, construction accidents, automobile, uh, uh, medical accidents, uh, and they're going to get paid out $250 billion of settlement claims from Geico, State Farm, and Allstate. There's a reason every time you turn on the TV during a football <laughs> game, you're, uh, you know, barraged with uh, liability insurance commercials. Mm -hmm. It's big, big, big business. Uh, when you dig into this personal injury world, uh, what you see is it's just old and archaic and broken. Uh, it's really opaque. Uh, there are a lot of players that are, there's just a lot of waste. Um, and so what happens is people have a case like let's say I rear end you, right? And so I, I, I hit your back of your car, I, you break your neck or your leg. Like we know who's at fault here. Like police comes, they write a police report, I rear ended you, it's cut and dry. Like we should be able to fix that immediately and rectify the situation, get you the cash from Geico or whomever that you need in order to pay your medical bills. Uh, but instead, Geico knows that they have a monopsony, like they're the only buyer possible for your claim. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're kind of the opposite of like mon a monopoly where you know, the only seller. Uh, and so they're just going to wait you out. And their data that their, their data that they you know compounded over years and years and years and run through tons of data science and underwriting demonstrates that if they wait, like they'll do better. Uh, so they'll wait two to three years on average, like jam up the courts, jam up the settlement proceedings. And throughout that time, you'll like systematically give away pieces of your case because you're probably one of the 72% of Americans living paycheck to paycheck and now you're injured and out of work. Uh, so you'll you'll immediately give like a third of your case to a personal injury lawyer who might even split your case with somebody if it actually goes to trial. And by the uh, third of your case, you mean like a third of the potential uh, mm -hmm. what earnings or whatever you could recoup, the the I don't even know what it's liability, whatever it's called. Yeah, let's 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 say your case is worth a million dollars. So like you're trying your to life. you're trying to get a million dollars from Geico, is what you're saying. Uh, you are going to get a million dollars from Geico. Mm -hmm. So you like lost your leg. Your case is worth this amount. Like we know what it's worth. Like there are so many of these. It's not like rocket science here. Like you are going to get paid out some uh, range here. Mm -hmm. uh, but the system has just uh, been constructed such that it makes sense for to jam it up. Uh, you'll hire a lawyer 
So probably someone you see on a billboard or a Jerry Springer commercial or a bus stop or a bus itself. Uh, that lawyer probably actually doesn't really ever take anything to trial. They're like a marketing lawyer because only mm -hmm. lawyers can market. So you'll give away a third year case to a lawyer that doesn't like really practice that much law. Like they more just like turn out these settlements and paperwork. Uh, if the case ever goes to trial, that lawyer actually doesn't know what to do. And so they'll actually have to refer it to a lawyer that actually <laughs> takes them for trial. It's called trial lawyer. Yeah. Um, and uh, then your lawyer will refer you to a chiropractor who will give you a bunch of injections and then an MRI center and then maybe an orthopedic surgeon. And throughout that time, you usually don't pay any money on the case. It just keeps sort of getting marked up. And so uh, you get a thousand dollar legal procedure and it's actually going to come out of your case at like three thousand dollars or something. Oh, man. Um, and then there are these finance companies that came along and realized that they could help break up that monopsony and give you as the as the plaintiff, as the injured party, uh, more options to say, sell your case to make better decisions or get li like um, living expenses so you can you know ultimately like, wait it out. And so those finance companies finance you, they finance the lawyers, they finance the doctors. Uh, what our company Mighty did was essentially create the connective tissue between all these parties, building out workflow software and servicing and capital services uh, to help support them, ultimately helping this end plaintiff, you know, get a better deal from the justice system so that they can, you know, earn more, earn it faster, yeah. have well, a better experience because it's it's like a nightmare for people going through this experience. Wild. Is it a is it a better deal or is it basically like you are owed a million dollars but you're going to get screwed by all these markups and you're not going to get it for three years we'll just give you 500 grand today and then we'll take this we'll take the payout which is ultimately going to be let's say seven hundred thousand dollars after mm -hmm. all the fees and so we're gonna basically we're gonna benefit from the fact that you just are not liquid you can't afford to not work you'll take the 500 grand today instead of the 700 grand in two years and we'll take the 200 grand profit by waiting two years. Yeah, so in, in healthcare, there's this concept right now, it's really big, called the triple aim. It's like, how do we make healthcare, uh, how do we improve, how do, how do we increase access, how do we improve outcomes, and how do we improve the overall patient experience? Because healthcare is super expensive and hard to access. Uh, it, like a lot of healthcare doesn't work, and we don't, like, we don't, build around what works. We build around like just billing people for services. Mm -hmm. And how do we make the patient experience not suck? Because healthcare is these like really low net promoter scores. You go in, you wait an hour, the doctor sees you, you already filled out the paperwork three times, maybe you do it again. The doctor's like kind of rude. <laughs> you know, you don't know where you're gonna get charged. Um, I think if I had to build like a triple aim for the you know, sort of a uh, personal injury legal system, it would be like faster outcomes, uh, like more from your settlements or like more overall cash uh, and just like better experience. Uh, so for a lot of people, they're dealing in like really opaque, we're going with really, a lot of really opaque parties. They don't know what the process is going to be. Sometimes they're like misled in terms of how fast it's going to be or what they should do. Uh, and they're like injured and out of work. And so they're in like a really desperate situation. Um, so I think those are like three different levers to pull and you know, there might be like some trade-offs between them. Uh, but our goal was to help and still is the companies to help build, you know, this software and connected tissue to help improve it for all the parties. Cause even like you look at the space and like the cost of capital is really expensive. So lawyers are getting these like really expensive loans and financial backing because no traditional financial institution can evaluate the like millions or hundreds of millions even of all of these legal cases, even though they're assets. Same with these injury doctors, same with these plaintiffs. Um, somebody came in and helped sort of improve their workflow, standardize all the reporting and data, get them cheaper cost of capital to, you know, take this sort of archaic but huge and important industry into the 21st century. You know, you just <laughs> you just crystallized something which is probably old news to you. In fact, you said it, so I'm sure it's old news, but the repeat player versus one-time player dynamic is such a useful heuristic to take to anything. And I'll just give a quick example. We're literally playing Dungeons and Dragons last night and we enter into this guy's land. And he starts being really nice to us and he wants to take us to dinner and show us around. He says it's a free dinner and he like owns this place. And we're like super excited. Well, we go, sorry, is this within the game? This or is where in a game, in a game. I need mean, I mean, the correct level of abstraction. Sure, here. sure. And, I, and I'll take this to a real life thing real quick. But essentially he winds and dines to say, is this free? Sure. And then there's dancers and there's this and people come give us a massage. And at the end we get the bill and the dinner's free, the table's free, but the dances cost money. The massage costs money. The ambiance all costs money. And we got we got grifted. And we believe, like, oh, we could outsmart this guy. 
And even in the context of the game, it's like, no, man, you just showed up here. Like, this guy's been running this scam forever. And this is this was my experience in uh, Tunisia. And not to say that there's anything bad about Tunisia, but, you know, you're a white guy. You show up, hey, where do we go get the camels? They take you on the camels. They tell you it's 15 uh, lira, which are, or dinar, I forget what it is in Tunisia. They take you out, and then they want 50 euro. And they insist that they said it was... And, and, and they didn't. It's just like, no, this guy is a repeat player. He knows he takes you out into the middle of nowhere on a beach and tells you that you're, you got to pay him whatever yeah, you're, you got to pay you're him. Gonna come up with what, you're going to come up with what you think are novel counters. Yeah. I, was, I was there for this camel scam, right? <laughs> so it's like, no, no, no. We say we heard 15 lira. And, and then he's they all like, start shouting. And he just goes, oh, like, I mean, not, not out loud, but in his head. He's like, do you think this is the first time someone's ever said, oh, I thought it, you said 15 lira? Like, I have an exact canned response for this which is then he starts turning in and yelling in arabic to a different person and and they're when obviously it's just part of the grift and that no one's ever going to get hurt but it's um they make you feel it's scary because yeah. all of a sudden you don't understand what's happening and two people are uh their voices are rising as they try to figure out quote unquote what to do with you because you won't pay yeah no, you, and so, you, convinced, you convinced me to move to brazil i know all about this thing <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah then you just go you know what forget it we'll just give you the 50 euro we'll get we'll get, get the screwed heck out because here. we're yeah. in the middle of nowhere now away from the city and it's just like yeah of course you're not gonna out negotiate this guy you're not the first person he took out to the camels it's the guy at for the 50 gym. euro you got Uma Fakata. <laughs> yeah and i'll just and i could go keep going but like i went I got screwed at the gym. You know, you sign up for a gym. They say, oh, no, it's just a one-month trial. We won't bill you after that. And, you know, we just want your bank account details. It's, And then that guy disappears, and uh, you read the contract, but this doesn't count, and they won't give you, you know, of course, you've lost your copy of the contract, and they've got a different version. Uh, no, the only point is that you're not the first person that I'm came to the, the gym. I'm not the first guy. I'm not the first guy who went, wait a second, is you, are you up to something? <laughs> and he went, no. It's so, yeah, just this idea of... Uh, yeah, it's a practice grift versus a first-time... Yeah, sucker. Just know where you are, I guess, in that context. Like, is this person? Uh, you know, you go to a used car salesman, you think you're going to out negotiate him because you're a clever kid. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just, just don't. So that's that's it's a really useful heuristic that I'm going to keep in mind because I got I was thinking of even purchasing one day soon, maybe a home, and like I'm going to get hosed. If I'm going to get. Uh, it's not that broker's first. I mean, it <laughs> might be the seller's first time selling, but there's a broker yeah. on the other side oh, yeah. that knows exactly how to get you to. Get, and the other thing is they convince you this is just standard. You have to do this. You're yeah. like, oh, don't worry about yeah, that. You have, you have to bid 15% over asking price. Or yeah. else there's no way you get it. Interesting. Um, yeah, man. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's another another sort of bias here, or heuristic called the, the principal agent problem that I think about a lot. So, uh, so oftentimes there's a gap between the person who like really cares and has the incentives and the agent acting on their behalf. So a uh, real estate broker is an incredible example of that, right? Like you buying or selling the house is like, you know, major, major life decision could be like the big, you know, your biggest asset that you'll own. Um, you could be paying off this mortgage for 30 years. The broker just wants to get it sold as fast as possible. So the broker is just incentivized whether or not, mm -hmm. you know, this ethical or not, like the incentive lies that they should go to the seller and try to get them to lower the price and go to the buyer and try to get them to increase the price. And they get really good at that. Yeah, so I think a lot about that's the same with your lawyer, whomever. Well, also in Sorry, investment banking, you also have to think about the the incentives, right? Because whether you're and I don't maybe this has changed, but when I was in investment banking, whether you are advising the buyer or the seller, you were going to get one percent of the deal. Which mm -hmm. means that I'm advising the buyer who would benefit from owning this business for as cheaply as possible. If they buy for one point three billion instead of one point four billion, they save a hundred grand a hundred million dollars but I get less money. And so when you're, when you're the seller, you and your financial advisor have perfectly aligned incentives. You both want the most money possible, but it's important to recognize when you're the buyer and you hire an investment bank, if they're compensated based on a higher price than netting them more money, you are at odds with your own advisor in terms of incentives. And I think that's something that escapes people. And to your point, again, if you're selling a business that you built for 15 years, you've probably, this is probably your first business that you're selling. It's probably the biggest windfall that you're going to make in your life. And you're with someone who's done this a thousand times. They don't care at all. They're working on 10 deals at the same time. It's not the most money they've ever made, but also they're going to try to uh, do what's best for them. So it's really important to make sure that what's best for them is what's best for you. Because if not, they're, they're going to go with their incentive over your incentive. Yeah. Is there a potential for repeat games between, say, you know, the Geico representative, the personal injury lawyer, and the judge? Like, what is the, do you know, can you speak to anything about that? Because one thing that just occurred to me is that 
yes, the plaintiff is new and fresh every time, but it, it might be the same three people <laughs> in, in, in court constantly. Well, just, just, it almost never goes to court. Okay. Almost everything settles out of Understood. court and never gets in front of a judge. So it's just between uh, the insurance company and the lawyer coming to- Who go assignment. back and forth constantly though, I imagine, right? Like they, they're, mm-hmm. they just, they have 10 cases a day that they're discussing with one another. Totally. And, you know, something that a company like Mighty is doing is helping to, you know, get better data to lawyers about, you know, what kind of, like how to negotiate those cases. And, um, you know, for instance, like it's sort of well known in sort of the underwriting world. And when you look at the data that, that like Geico, follow harder, other insurance companies. Um, and so, you know, there, there's ways to, especially if you're a repeat player, especially if you're backed by like actual data and resources and not just your intuition to negotiate some of these things more effectively. Interesting. Cool. What's yeah. more fun to work on personal injury law or psychedelic mental health, <laughs> self-improvement? Okay. Well, well, my mind is like my Ica guy, right? It's like the perfect cross section of, uh, the change I want to see in the world, what I love doing. So like what the world needs, what I love doing, what I'm really good at and you know, what can earn compensation. Uh, so it's like deep sense of fulfillment. Um, but Mighty was also super fun. I mean, it wasn't it like in my Ica guy, or at least it wasn't. What is an Ica that, guy? Uh, it's what I just described. It's like a Japanese concept oh, okay. for personal fulfillment. Got it. It's at the cross section of yeah, like those four. Th- those Quadruple four. Quadruple Venn uh, diagram thing going on. I got you. Okay. It's like a pedal, yeah, pedal pedal diagram. Um, but Mighty was so fun. I mean, it was incredibly challenging. You know, I grew up in the 70% of Americans who live paycheck to paycheck, and we never had a serious accident. But I'd like a single working class father who was a mailman, now a bus driver, taking care of a, my mentally ill mother, you know, my sister who's had some issues, and me. Uh, and if we, if he had gone in an accident and been out of work, we'd been fucked. So, you know, seeing how broken that system was and seeing that like we're meeting people on like, the worst day of their lives, like injured and out of work and take care of their families uh, and helping to modernize that and increase access to, you know, workflow software and data and, and you know, really bringing the internet and software to bear on this archaic and huge industry was super fun um, and inspiring too. But, you know, it's hard to get other people inspired. <laughs> it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier to get, you know, some of the smartest, uh, most ambitious people I know to, you know, quit their jobs and come work in mind bloom and build this with me than, than it wasn't mighty. That's for sure. Nope. Cool. Anything else you want to, no, Maybe before we wrap, I think we're good, man. Thanks for coming on, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on, man. We appreciate having you, and we'll talk to you soon, dude. This is a blast. Thanks, guys. All right. Peace. Peace.